And we're going to the last talk uh, of this oral session and actually of the whole conference. Um, so it will be a novel segmentation framework for uveal melanoma in MRI based on a class activation maps. And I think it will be presented by the last author, if I'm not mistaken, Merichel Bach Quadra. Did I say it right? Quite well, thank you. <laughs> so yes, unfortunately, uh, our first author could not make it today, but I'm very pleased to present on his behalf. Uh, let me start with the clinical motivation of, of this uh, research project. So this is about ocular tumor segmentation, and this is about the uveal melanoma. Um, so this is the um, primary, primary intraocular uh, uh, disease in adult uh, population, and it has actually a survival rate of barely 70% at five years and 50% around in 50 years. This might drop drastically if you have a metastasis. And actually, the majority of the wheel melanoma are choroidal melanomas. So my previous speaker had already quite a graph, but in case you don't recall, this is the eye anatomy, and here you can see the choroid, and here you have this type of tumors. These are the lens, the vitreous, the optic nerve, and the sclera. So this is about the majority of these uh, tumors are today treated by proton radiation therapy. And uh, in 80% of the centers doing such a therapy, uh, this works uh, with the software called A-Plan. And uh, let me explain you a little bit what it is about. So basically, they will exploit the ophthalmic images that they have acquired for diagnosis. And in this case, we have, for instance, the fundus and the ultrasound. And from those uh, images that are 2D images, they will estimate uh, manually the axial length and the tumor height. These are two parameters that have to be included in the A-plan software. Then at certain point in the evaluation of the patient, when they are prepared to get the therapy, they will have a surgery under general anesthesia where these uh, uh, tantalum clips will be um, attached around the tumor border. And from transillumination, for instance, they will uh, measure which is the tumor basal size. This is another marker that have to put in the plan. And then in the day of the treatment, they will have x-rays to localize actually these clips according to the axis of the, of the eye and, and to situate the, the, the tumor. All this will be included uh, with the manual delineation of the border of the tumor according to the clips. And due to the uncertainty of these um, uh, measurements, they will add um, a margin in our uh, center of 2.5 millimeters that they will irradiate as well. So I don't know you, but me, I was very impressed when I saw how it was done in practice because I was wondering what is the 3D information in all, all this process. And this is where magnetic, on, ma magnetic resonance imaging uh, came uh, into the picture. Um, MRI in ophthalmic images, it was not mentioned today in the keynote, but uh, um, it's more and more used. I'm um, thinking in the retinoblastoma in children, for instance, and the uveal melanoma in adults. And actually, we have quite good spatial resolution, 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 isotropic, and we have a very good tissue contrast. So you can see. Here, uh, for instance, a T1-weighted MRI of the eye with a choroid melanoma here. And you can hear, for instance, very well the vitreous in a T2-weighted. You can see the tumor is all this dark, uh, epo-intense area here. You th see other things as well going on that might be very useful, like the retinal detachment or the hemorrhage. And here, a little bit, you can see a little bit of the lens. Here, you see the sclera. Not everything is beautiful, to be honest with you. So in children, when they are acquiring ocular MRI, children are asleep, and there is no so much motion artifacts. In adults, actually, we ask them to fix a light during the acquisition in a way that they move as less as possible. However, these are uh, patients with tumors, so they have problems actually in, fixa in fixating the, the eye. So these are kind of motion artifacts that we might have been dealing with. So you see these uh, blurry areas. Despite this, we want to go for the challenge, and we really believe uh, that we should go towards an automatic segmentation of the ocular tumor and the eye structures. We think that actually having this patient-specific 3D anatomy included in the, in the therapy planning would be uh, very useful. And there are many reasons for this, so you saw a little bit uh, um, the uncertainty that you may have. So having this information may be 
allows us to reduce this um, additional margin that they add for radiation because radiation structures that are healthy or sometimes depending on the position of the tumor, we might be inducing other side effects or loss of the vision. And as well, there are cases where indeed 2D ultrasound and transillumination cannot really do good measurements because of the shadow that the big tumor might generate. And thinking a little bit further, there is a lot of research in novel melanoma about um, the genetics of the tumor and how to distinguish uh, the profile of, of the genetic profile of, of those tumors. And in that sense, I think that the radiomics could be as well very helpful um, uh, to study and to link to that. And even if we are a little bit more futuristic, I agree, but still um, very interesting to think about it, is you see that there is this invasive surgery to delimitate the tumor with the clips. Why not thinking about a clipless procedure? Of course, linked to other technologies like a live eye tracker during the therapy. So I hope I convinced you that it would be very interesting to go for it. We didn't found other works uh, today that were actually tackling the problem of ocular tumor segmentation. We started a few years ago, and we were working basically first to target the, um, the segmentation of, let's say, the healthy structure, like the sclera and the lens, the vitreous. And we have been working on, on active shape models that proved to be better to the spherical and elliptical models developed so far. And uh, these models are actually very good in capturing that anatomy, despite the presence of a big tumor inside the eye. Concretely, about tumor segmentation, we started uh, uh, with retinoblastoma in children, and this is a joint work that we did here with uh, um, uh, people uh, with Ben, with uh, Daniel Ruckert and um, Camistas. And actually here we were uh, working on comparing a shallow architecture to a deep architecture. We still do, uh, since we had very few data set, we, had doing, we were be doing some feature engineering in our site with patient-specific features. And the results here for our segmentation of the retinoblastoma were um, barely okay, about 60% of overlap in average. And then we extended these, and we this time tried a 3D unit instead of um, a 3D CNN. Here we were increasing a little bit the data set uh, uh, to 32 uh, retinoblastoma patients, and we were still going this uh, average of 60% uh, of overlap. So why it's so difficult? And we believe we are suffering from the same problem that half of the conference is suffering, because I saw this all the time these three days. We don't have data. We don't have annotated data. Still, we want to do deep learning. So uh, the, the idea here uh, was inspired by weekly supervised uh, lesion segmentation methods. Um, sorry, but this is by no means an exhaustive uh, uh, review of papers, just two papers that catch our attention. Uh, because what they do actually is to start instead to, with a segmentation problem with a classification problem. And when you are in a CNN um, architecture, so you can have weekly labels, like saying, are you normal or abnormal? And then, as you may know, uh, the first layers work mostly as for the extraction of the features. And at the very last layer, you are taking the decision in between these two classes. And then when it comes class activation maps that can actually uh, map, which is the discriminative uh, points in the image that actually are used to take the decision for such a class. And these are two works that were then doing some post-processing and doing to the lesion segmentation. So this is actually what we propose, and we wanted to investigate in this work, can we do that and replace the manual annotation of the experts? And here, what we will propose, I will go a little bit more in details right after, is to have this uh, question of uh, are you pathological or not, or do you have a tumor or not. We will have a look on where the network is paying attention to take such a decision. We will include some prior knowledge that we have on the topic, and then we will use these actually as if they were uh, manual annotations to train a 2D architecture. So, uh, I don't know exactly the details, but for the experts in the room, this is the architecture that uh, we decided to use, a ResNet, uh, solving this binary problem, presence or absence of a, of a tumor. And then uh, we decided to go to compute the gradient weighted class activation mapping that is uh, um, just a generalization on the class activation maps that I mentioned before. And basically, the difference here is that they are measuring which is the importance of the, of the, of the nodes uh, in taking that decision. And another difference in that case is that they are as well just constraining to take on 
the, um, the nodes that are taking a positive decision, so you have a tumor. This is to prevent to have uh, points that are taking negative decision and are, are outside. So here we have a result with an eye and the tumor, and for me it was very restorating to see those results because it's always kind of a black box, and basically what you can see is the network was taking into account those points to take the decision, as well some points outside. But still, it is very meaningful to me. Oops. So we wanted to uh, inject some prior knowledge in this problem because we have it. And uh, the idea basically is we could just to start focusing only on inside of the eye. And for this, we rely on our previous work in active shape models that work very well in detecting the sclera up to 96% of accuracy. And this way, we will get rid of any activation outside that area. And then we wanted as well to further refine uh, these maps, and uh, we will proceed to a label agreement uh, assignment uh, using the dense conditional random fields. And this is basically assigned labels by optimizing an energy. And just briefly, the energy takes into account an unary term that here it contains the input intensity and which is the probability of having a label according to that input intensity. For us, basically, this is uh, the class activation map indeed. And then we have appearance and smoothness terms based on the intensity and the spatial uh, location. We have as well um, a POTS model to, to weight the favorable um, neighboring labels. And with this now, it will be just used in a 2D unit, like if we were doing having manual uh, annotations. Let me talk about the data set. So this was a dedicated study where we were recruiting 16 healthy volunteers and 24 uveal melanoma patients. For the volunteers, as much as possible, we were scanning the two eyes. And we have at the end uh, 20 i T1 weighted images and 25 T2 weighted images that we could exploit. Uh, for the uveal melanoma, we have uh, 24 T1 weighted and 22 T2 weighted. We have quite good spatial resolution, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.88 isotropic for the T2 weighted. And here you have two examples of a healthy anatomy of our volunteer and of the patient. It's exactly the same MR sequence that we acquire. We wanted as well to set up a baseline of performance or what it would be done in other problems with other architectures. So we decided to compare our, our approach with the, our previous work using a 3D unit. And here you have the details of the implementation of this 3D unit. We had as well, it happens that we have some approaches for multiple sclerosis, and we decided as well to try this type of 3D CNN architecture. It's actually a cascade of two CNNs, and the particularity is it works with patches. And of course, we will be using the 2D unit with, uh, trained with the manual segmentations and the 2D unit trained with our generated segmentations. Finally, we had the uh, manual annotations for 60 patients, and we will proceed to a leave one out analysis quantitatively for those patients. And what it concerns, the initial step of generating our own labels in there, we will use the 24 uh, uveal melanoma patients, because there we, win, we, we don't need manual annotations, uh, basically. Uh, let me comment now a little bit on these results. So this is the overlap uh, that we obtain. Um, and the first thing that you could see is that it, uh, 3D architectures perform lower than 2D architectures uh, in the best case of 70% of dice. I think it's normal because they do not have as many training data as the 2D architectures when we work with um, a number of uh, 2D slices. Uh, but well, so this is what it happens. And then what I think it's more interesting here is to have a look on the results that we have with our uh, generated labels to train and the ones that correspond to the uh, manual annotations, the ground truth. And in this case, we didn't find statistical significant differences. So we could conclude eventually that we can get rid of the manual expert segmentation and still having equivalent performance. And um, mentioned that now we are 
up already to an average 28% of dyes overlap in what it regards the, the tumor segmentation accuracy. So I think this is promising. Let's have a look what it means, these dyes. So here you have uh, three patients, the results with a T1 weighted, three different patients, and the results in a T2 weighted. The first column is what it would be very good agreement, a very high dyes. In green, you see our estimated segmentation. In red, the manual contour. It's more interesting to have a look to the second column, where the dyes is a little bit lower. But in, my op in our opinion, um, our segmentation seems to fit better the underlying intensity. So at certain point, we could say that maybe the expert was not so precise in doing the segmentation. And in the last column, I have to present you what are we doing wrong. So basically, our network fails whenever it's something more than the tumor. In this case, the tumor is just a certain specific area, but there is this retinal detachment that, uh, that bothers the segmentation. In terms of volume, you see on the right the bland almond plots. And basically, what you can see is that the bigger of the tumor, the bigger uh, the error in volume uh, is. Still, we are not doing so bad, though it seems to have one or two outliers. OK, so to conclude, uh, we have proposed this uh, novel segmentation framework, uh, weekly supervised, I would say, but actually that it, it tends to say that we can go without the notations for medical experts. We have this uh, evaluation with different architectures. OK, 2D seems to perform better than 3D, uh, in, in, at least with this number of images. Uh, we acknowledge the limitations that the reviewers pointed out as well. Of course, we have a very small data set. And this is still a leave one out uh, scenario. And in future work, we think, though, that this can be now applied further uh, with other input images. I would like to really thank all the subjects and patients that accepted to volunteer to be included in our study, the Swiss Cancer Research uh, League for funding this uh, project, and of course you for your attention. The paper is open, this wonderful paper, the last one, come on. Otherwise I'll stay, I'll never leave. Never gonna close the conference. I, I have a flight to catch. You're gonna miss your trains. Yes. <laughs> Eventually. So you have uh, quite remarkable results. So I was just wondering if you know what the intra-observer variability is for this. So like, what's the dice agreement between experts? No, we don't have two experts. I mean, we didn't even have one expert at certain point, so having two, it was... <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I cannot tell you this. I, I have no clue. Come on. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, thanks for this talk. Uh, as I understand, uh, the training data for the 2D unit uh, model is generated through the uh, classification model. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, I, I, sorry, can you I hear didn't. Me? Yeah, can you repeat, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the training data for the 2D unit model is generated through a classification model through the activations. So the training data for the 2D unit, on one side it will be the one that would do manual annotations, on the other side is what we generate from the classification. Yes, okay. this is what you're asking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you comment on uh, the motivation of uh, training a separate segmentation model uh, to match the output of another model? Like, or in other words, have you tried uh, getting quantitative results uh, uh, only by uh, evaluating the outputs from the classification model instead of just trying to match the two outputs? I cannot tell. I, I, I'm not sure if we completed those results. Uh, so if I'm understand, understanding the question, you were curious to know which is the results directly from our generated annotations? This is what you mean? Uh, the question is basically, I'm just trying to understand the motivation of uh, training a separate model to match an output of a, another automatic yeah. model. Yeah. Well, basically, we were trying to answer just the, can we replace or not those annotations? So this is why we, can, we go for the second round, actually. Uh, Eventually, you can see as well, instead of that we go towards a final annotation, we can as well, for instance, maybe as well, directly train 
the, to the unit with the uh, uh, GradCam uh, maps. So even maybe without having a real segmentation, this maybe goes more in that sense. Yeah, or maybe it regularizes it more. Yeah. Just wanted to hear it also. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Somebody, yes, here. See, everybody's afraid. Hi. So uh, I was just wondering when you're talking about the data availability. So. Um, it's the case that you have in, in, in brain MRI scans, typically the eyes are also in the scans. Are they too different in the appearance or in the resolution? Or have you, have you tried like, um, yeah, fraud using the uh, brain scans or the, the uh, region uh, with the eyes from those scans for, for your task? Or is it generally not possible? I, I didn't understand, sorry. If I'm using the brain, no, if you're lacking, you're lacking data, if I understand yeah. correctly. Um, and just, just in, as in, um, like, yeah, I'm not from the field, but uh, is it an idea to, to take um, the eye region from, from brain scans, so that is often um, in the field of view, if you have M MRT scans? Yeah, but I need that? to have two more uh, scans, not only healthy anatomy. You're right. You we can exploit definitely uh, any eye anatomy for the healthy side, but at the end of the day, I need to have rather... Uh, two more data as well uh, to train and annotate it. Okay, so, so you're not lacking um, healthy cases, but two no, more cases? No, I'm not lacking at all of healthy cases, but yes, of the, of the two more cases. Okay, thanks. A little bit in your sense, though, I think your idea is very good, but uh, we were thinking actually at certain point to mix what it would be the retinoblastoma with the uveal melanoma. Uh, so just to generate more, more, more data sets. Surprisingly, we didn't manage to, to have improved results by mixing the two types of tumors that indeed they appear very different though. Um, and there is as well a scaling factor because children have much smaller eyes, but still I was expecting in there being possible to gather such a data, but so far we didn't have to really improvement doing so. Question. People in the back. I'll come there. Oh my God. Come on. Nobody going once and twice. <laughs> All right. Let's thank the speaker.